Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. Today, my guest is Corinthia A. Barber. She has over 20 years of experience in organizational development, education, training, and human resources. Corinthia is recognized as a world-class speaker, seasoned consultant, trainer, and coach. She currently serves as an adjunct faculty member and the president of Professional Development Associates, a consulting practice that provides coaching, consulting, and education services to organizations. She provides a wide range of organizational development and training services, including workshops, facilitating focus groups, seminars, and staff retreats and coaching. She joins us today to discuss a recently conducted survey on the impact of the pandemic. The results identified a number of areas that the pandemic has had and is having, both on individuals and organizations. We're going to be talking about the impact of the pandemic, prospering post-pandemic, and the importance of connection and mindset. Corinthia, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. I am happy to be here with you today. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have you. Maybe you can kind of start out by telling uh, everybody a little bit more about yourself. I, I gave you uh, the intro, but I'm sure there's a lot more detail and, and background to how you got here and, and, and what you're up to. Yes. Thank you so much. So I have evolved from a nine-year-old entrepreneur to a successful award-winning business person who all of my work is geared to positively impacting the lives of people. And I've been fortunate enough to do that in a number of ways via my consulting practice, where I help organizations to become more effective and efficient. I also help with all areas of human capital development. So whether um, there is a need for leadership development, communication skills development, conflict, whatever the human capital area of uh, opportunity, because I I like to call it opportunity, not deficiency. Mm -hmm. I am able to help individuals and organization in those ways. Um, In addition, I'm a certified coach. Um, So I work with individuals, whether they are executives of organizations or boundary level employees. I am able to create supportive environments where people can thrive and help them develop uh, specific strategies and action plans to get them from where they are to where they like to be. So I've been doing that for many, many years, and it has evolved and expanded as a result of some client engagements, oftentimes I go in, I'm asked to come in an organization for one engagement and based on the success there, um, it expands and evolves into other areas of opportunity. Okay. Um, so I just, um, I just look at ways to add value and support people in their journey. Um, And I've been very fortunate to be able to do that for a very long time and in a number of different arenas. Awesome. Awesome. And so this has a a real big impact on how people, uh, their health, their mental health and their physical health and well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever I am asked to conduct a leadership training, Mm -hmm. I approach it from a holistic perspective. So I say to organizational leaders, it's not just about, you know, what individuals produce in the workplace. You must be concerned about that person in a holistic way and provide the necessary support for him or her because it's interconnected. You can't expect it's unrealistic 
to think that someone who is struggling with some mental challenges or even physical challenges is going to show up and leave that behind when they come into the workplace. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then the impact of what the environment of the workplace is like will also influence. Yeah. Absolutely. And because gonna, many times, yeah. sadly, I have talked to many people who have said to me, Corinthia, I feel great on the weekends. But on Sunday evening, I develop, I get a headache. My back starts to hurt because they dread going into an unhealthy work environment. Right. Yeah. And that impacts all of our social environment, our communities. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, and uh, you know this, I'm, you'll probably concur that like the number one day for emergency room issues with heart conditions is Monday, Sunday, Monday, right? Yes. People have to go back to work. Stress levels go up. It's funny how that happens. Uh, it's not funny, but it, it's just kind of, it's, it's true. Work can, yes. be, work can be really quite a chore and, and not very fun. Yeah. And coupled with, you know, personal changes, for example, what we've all been impacted by the pandemic, some of us more than others. And you layer that on top of unhealthy work environments, um, strained relationships in the workplace, yeah. or you know, with either subordinate to supervisor or peer to peer, all of that takes a toll on individuals, whether they recognize it or not. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes just pointing it out, right? Uh, is is half the battle naming it giving it a name right yes and uh and then trying to figure out how i would assume from if i were in your shoes i'd want to work systemically to alleviate some of the stressors in the system that's the tricky part i'm sure it's and that's a challenging part it's one the, the most challenging is getting key decision makers to understand and appreciate the environmental impacts. Exactly. Because yeah. the default is to go to uh, speaking about a lack of performance or a lack of something on the part of an employee. Yeah, blame blame the victim. Absolutely. <laughs> Oftentimes, yeah. We create healthier, more positive environments that give rise to employee growth, development, and contributions, not only does the employee benefit, but the organization benefits. And organizations that haven't understood that or embraced that are going to have greater challenges moving forward. Right. Because right. one of the things that has occurred during the pandemic is, you know, everyone has experienced heightened anxiety and uncertainty. People are working alone or in isolation. And it has resulted in many individuals reassessing what's really important, reassessing their priorities mm -hmm. and deciding that my peace of mind, my mental health, my total health and wellness is more important than a paycheck. Absolutely. Yeah. And now we have things like the uh, what's the mass resignation that's occurring. Correct. Uh, and well, this might be this is a good thing, a good way to segue into the the survey you did. If you can, you tell us about the survey, maybe for uh, the psychology nerds out there and the statistical nerds. Uh, what how like what was the number of the survey? How many people did you survey? And and, and okay, what is, I surveyed two hundred two hundred and fifty people participated in the survey. Okay, and it, it, it I. <clears throat> The survey came out of my um, observations and informal conversations and just paying attention to what was going on as a result of the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. So as a, consult as a consultant, I had this burning desire to try to help people because um, that's what I do. So I developed the survey circulated it via my contacts, had other people, was online, mm -hmm. um, used social media, and there was an overwhelming response. And this is all like blind survey raters. They just gave, gave you, they poured their hearts out. No, nobody, nobody from HR was going to give them a, a dirty, 
a dirty look or anything. Excellent. Exactly. Right. And, and I made it very clear it was confidential. And, you know, so as a result, I was amazed at the results. Over 50 percent of the respondents were males. Okay, which, that's, that's probably kind of big. Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about, as you know better than I do, when you're talking about mental health challenges, men tend to be a little more reluctant in discussing those kinds of things. <laughs> Correct. Yes. And people were talking, the responses were things like, um, one of the questions was, what could be of support and assistance to you at this time? People listed uh, listening. Men ask you to listen to them. (laughs) Men ask you to listen. Just someone to listen to me. You know, uh, it takes probably a few few good sessions to get to the listening thing. In, in my work with men, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on my my gender or sex or whatever as a cisgendered male. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's that's interesting. OK, yeah. listening. I found that to be most interesting, particularly when, you know, I do some training around communication skills effectiveness. And as you, you know, you alluded to when you talk about cross gender communication, generally, you know, females tend to talk about males not listening. Uh, But people talked about having someone to listen, um, providing them with some crisis management, Mm -hmm. coping skills, uh, someone who they could confide in and talk about their challenges, their mental health challenges, their depression. All of these words came up in individual responses. That's, uh, you know, kudos uh, for my team <laughs> for doing that, you know. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, so kudos, yeah, kudos to you, but kudos to the men to actually say that. To yeah. Invest, invest in the survey and say that. And I, I w- that was, you know, very pleasing, surprising, but very pleasing um, to get that level of response. Um, there were responses regarding financial insecurity. Uh, from some of the male respondents, their finance, the, the reference to financial uh, stability also was tied into feeling inadequate and not being able to provide for their families mm. and the struggles that were coming from that. Uh, so sense of security, uh, financial stability, health and wellness, housing and living arrangements, and changes in family situations were the top things that surfaced. Many, um, pro- uh, let's see, about 30% of the respondents had lost a loved one during the okay. pandemic. Okay. Either from the pandemic itself or from some sort of other thing. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Was there anything about that I didn't, I didn't catch in the list? Was there anything in there about child care? There was nothing about child care. And I suspect that was a result of people working from home or either being unemployment, okay, unemployed. So, so the majority of them were probably uh, professional workers who were working via Zoom. OK. Yeah, that was that was the sense that I got. Okay. Um, um, so as a result of the information from the survey that only in, intensified my desire to do something more. Um, So I actually um, hosted a virtual summit called Prospering Post-Pandemic Total Health and Wellness. And I gathered um, a number of mental health professionals. Um, There was the first, the day started with, I actually had an economist come on and talk about the, the projections based on where we were in the economy to pay, paint a realistic picture for people to understand, okay, this is where we are. It's, this is where it's projected we're going and how you fit into that and what you may need to do in terms of some additional things or shifting your focus. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, so I had an economist come on and then the first um, session was the importance of connection. 
And the panelists were all people that I had actually met during the pandemic in one way or another, virtually. We, none of us had met face-to-face until the event. Wow. And they talked about, you know, how during the pandemic, it was so important to connect with other people in other ways versus face-to-face. Um, there were, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the new audio apps that are out. Uh, there's one, the most popular one is Clubhouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was on that for a while. Yeah. That was okay. Kind of, it was interesting. Just kind of. Even just eavesdropping in on conversations was kind of fun. Yeah. And I think the timing of that app um, rolling out was at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that's what's facilitated their success because there was this need for people to connect and to connect with strangers and having conversations yeah, I was I, I was talking with a buddy of mine who invited me on at New York, a, 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 an acting coach, and it was just like I had no one else, no one was in this particular meeting, and I remember like it was just like having a walkie-talkie and from <laughs> from from on my phone from his, you know, it, like between you know Chelsea and 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 uh, my downtown Loop apartment. It was, just, <laughs> it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool. So. Um- we, we, they, that's what you know. People talked about how they met people and have built relationships and done business with people, um, and how that helped them mm-hmm. get through the isolation and loneliness of the pandemic. Now, the isolation in the community is important, and the connection is important, as as you said, Corinthia. But I wonder how many people are also like going, you know. I can cut down on the amount of social time and and the busy, busy, busy of life. I I realize that I'm okay with having more solitude. Is that, did that show up anywhere within, within the survey? Um, That did not show up in the survey. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had some informal conversation with friends and I know for me, (laughs) that's a reality. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're a closeted uh, introvert then. I really am. Yeah. Um, if you're, fr- I'm sure you're familiar with the Myers Briggs. Oh yeah, um, and I, I I am an INFJ. I'm your I'm like. And I'm, see, I'm, I am an ENTP. Okay. However, it, it, it twenty years ago I was an INTP. Yeah, in other words, you're, but you know what the interesting thing about that. For you, for you, psych nerds out there, even though that doesn't have much validity, the, the retest, retest reliability. I took it when I was younger, and I think I was an e, ENFJ, not an INFJ, and now I'm an INFJ or something. One of mm-hmm. them, maybe I was, I was a perceiver, not a, a, a judger or something like that. But it's pretty. It was pretty close. I mean, and it was a, it was a, a span of about fifteen years. I took it in grad school one time and then I, a couple times and I, it, it was always the same in grad school, but like it was pretty much this, the same quadrants, right? Yeah. yeah um, the quadrants are pretty much the same. The research says, well, suggests that if you, the more you get out of your natural propensity for whichever quadrant you fall into, yeah. the, the more that becomes a part of your natural style. So they're not really like stable traits per se, which is right. kind of cool, which like you you can use that as like, oh, I'm working in a situation where I need to present a lot and I'm a true introvert, you know. And, so and at the end of the day, anxiety. you can go yeah. back into your cocoon. And that's what I do because of what I do. You know, I'm always interacting. I'm highly interactive. Yeah. Um, I'm high energy. But at the end of the day, if I don't have to talk to anyone, that's a wonderful evening for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, sometimes it's the best, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's under, underrated. It's just, yes. yeah, solitude's underrated. Well, well what, so in the, um, in the virtual summit, what else did you, what else? Did okay. You so the, the next panel was mental, the importance of mental health. Mm-hmm. And I, there were four uh, female uh, clinicians mm-hmm. who talked about, you know, they, they, I had a moderator who asked specific questions in terms of, you know, what they were seeing 
Um, what are some signs and symptoms if you're noticing something in one of your family members or friends, or if you're experiencing, when should you seek help? Mm -hmm. um, they told, spoke very candidly um, in terms of how they had been impacted. Um, you know, because people forget that folks like you, you know, are human. <laughs> so exactly. just be, you know, the, the, the helper, the supporter, the clinician um, often needs some time to get away, to regroup, you know, and get some uh, Yeah, I've been, I've been making the point to take like a, a week off every quarter to just like in the summertime kayak on the river every day or, you know, here in Chicago or things, whatever. Like I take a week off where I just kind of like exhale. Good for you. Yeah. yeah that important. is so important. So they spoke about the importance of that. And it was, it was an excellent uh, panel, a lot of positive feedback. And then the third panel was the importance of men's mental health. So based on the responses to the survey, I separated it and had men only. And it was like observing men in a barber shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've been there. Um, so cool. they barber were, shop, yeah. you know, they were very open and vulnerable and t talking about, um, th there was two clinicians and then there were two, um, other gentlemen, one who has had, um, challenges with depression and has written a book about it. And another is a gentleman who out of Canada who works with uh, men's groups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they talked about their own journey, how they were not feeling comfortable sharing, um, how it showed up in their behavior and some of the decisions that they've made. Yeah. Well, no, you mentioned barbershop and I, I laugh because like there's two things. I, I remember going to old school barbers when I was younger with my dad and they were kind of like just kind of a place where you talk about your problems in a guy kind of shoot from the hip way. And I, I, I think that might have fallen away in, in some fallen away in some areas for uh, white demographics. But I, I, I'm, under, I'm, I'm of the understanding that like in the African-American community, barbershops are where you go to get your counseling. Absolutely. You, you can barber go to a bar. A but yeah. Salon. Yeah. A hair salon and a barbershop, right? <laughs> so like you're, 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 it's a lot more affordable <laughs> than yeah. I am. You don't have to have insurance to get a haircut. <laughs> um, but, but you mentioned that. So, um, were the demographics, was it a mixed demographics? Was it across the board? Like uh, The men's panel? Yeah, it was a mixed They were all African-American men. Okay. Well, good for them. Yeah. Good for them because that's such a stigma in, in the African-American community, talking about mental health as mental health. If you talk about yes. it some other way, right? Mm -hmm. You can frame it in a way that it's not as taboo. And uh, there were so many women who reached out saying, thank you. I learned so much. Now I'm in a better position to support the man in my life. And, you know, it's the listening thing because sometimes, sometimes when I'm in, a, and I'm in a, I've been in a relationship with my wife for like almost 20 years now and she'll try to solve. It's, it's the opposite thing. I'll, I'll just want to vent and just have somebody to listen to me. And she's like, what do you want me to do? I said, I don't want you to do anything. Why do you want me to do it? What? Just listen, you know? Uh, and, and it is, I think that men need, they, they don't listen to each other a lot and they might have the, like, they don't want to look like vulnerable in front of another man. That, mm -hmm. That's considered a sign of weakness. I mean, it's a considered a sign of weakness if, if somebody's going to whoop your butt uh, physically, <laughs> but I think <laughs> learning that you can actually still talk to somebody and, and, uh, be vulnerable and no one's going to hold it against you or exactly. You, pull it on you in some other frame of like conversation later on with another mm -hmm. guy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we all need that. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately either people don't have it or are reluctant to seek it out or take advantage of it mm -hmm. because of their images of what's macho, what's manly or, or not trusting of other people. Cause I think particularly in the African American community, I know that's a factor. Yeah. Um, the trust that, well, this, that, that, that I can trust this person with yeah. my vulnerability yeah. um, and I can trust that they won't 
think differently of me and I can trust that they won't violate my confidence. Absolutely. And, and that, that's a tricky thing. I mean, it is easier if you pay somebody to do that. You know, the barbershop might be a little bit harder to keep that confidence <laughs> thing because everybody in the community is going there, right? But, you right. Know, but like in situations if they were to come to me or my co-host Kyle on the show, yeah, that'd be very similar. Or another psychotherapist or psychologist, counselor, uh, that it's kind of built in. I can't snitch on anybody. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know that. Yeah, there ah, are consequences. Sucks. There are consequences yeah, you know. and you're not supposed to. Like, it's not the part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's so many people, and even in just this experience of conducting the survey, hosting the summit, there are people who want to have these conversations with me. And I'm like, well, have you considered talking to a therapist? Well, I'm not that bad. You know, it's like there are people <laughs> have their mind, their levels of uh, depression or levels of anxiety, and they haven't reached that level yet. Well, I mean, there, there's something, there is something to be said for that, uh, Corinthia, because like a lot of times people come when they're in really bad shape, which if they had come earlier and just kind of a little bit of, you know, verbal voodoo and, and, uh, jujitsu on the part of the therapist could, could settle things a lot faster as opposed to like yeah, that breaking point. But that's, that's what we're prepared to do is to deal with those kind of like high intensity experiences for people. And, you know, as well as just kind of like, you know, uh, mentoring people. You know? yeah. But, yeah, and I'm saying right. if I have a headache for more than a few days, Go then to I'm going to do what's necessary to prevent me from having it for two weeks. <laughs> yes. Because it may be something that I need yeah. to know about that's going on that we need to address. Well, you, you know what you're saying, though? People will readily address a physical ailment mm -hmm. and they will not think that. Like we have this, we have this thing in 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 like the Western uh, physicalist mentality that the stuff that goes on behind the eyeballs isn't real. Mm -hmm. But it's probably more real than you know than the stuff outside of your eyeballs. In some respects, mm -hmm. it's it's how you perceive everything. It's your psyche, your soul, right? And mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have that, you know, if you don't have your mental health, what do you have? Right, because your mental health affects your physical health. Exactly. Yeah. It affects your community. It affects your relationship with your kids, your, your mm -hmm. mom, your dad, your grandparents, you know, your church, your temple, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. Well, this is, this is exciting. This is really awesome work that you're, you're doing. Was there anything else in yes, the, there, the virtual so summit? The last, the last panel was mm -hmm. the how to maintain your inner strength. Mm-hmm. So one, um, there was a clinician, a um, clinical psychologist on the panel. There was a young lady who is 21 years old, who has had mental health challenges, mm -hmm. who has founded a podcast to help cool. other young people. Awesome. And she spoke very openly and candidly about her journey and how well she, she's now studying to become a psychologist. Awesome. Cool. And her mission is to not only help others, but to remove, you know, the stigma around mm -hmm. mental health, particularly right. as it relates to young people as well. Um, and then there was a gentleman who had some major health and other challenges and has developed a holistic approach to health that includes diet, um, mindfulness, um, and, and other things. So that was a wonderful, it was kind of a how to, what to do moving forward. We've had some recognition of understanding where we may be as it relates to our mental health Okay. and some concrete things you can do to build and maintain your inner strength. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So it sounds like it was really inspiring. And this was recently, this is in December. Uh, that was held in November, November. Okay. Yes. And is there like, uh, a request for an encore performance, so to speak? There is, uh, there's a request for not only an encore performance, but a taking it on the road around the country. Okay. 
Um, so I'm waiting to see how we're doing with Omicron and all of that to see if we're going to actually do that. One hope would hope that we're almost through this, right? I hope so. You know, who would have ever thought that we'd be into the third year? <laughs> Well, I actually kind of did. The people I've, I've like, uh, people, I don't want to, everybody's going to send me lots of, lots of hate mail now. Uh, at least I'll get some mail, right? Um, <laughs> I'll bet. Well, I think that uh, most epidemiologists and people who study pandemics are saying, it's this is probably, even from the get there, like, you know, they were, weren't very ha- happy with the way politicians on either side of the fence were we're talking about it because it's mostly just calming people's nerves down. Yep. But the false, I think the false sense of, uh, you don't want to dash people's hopes, but if you told them out, out the starting gate, this is a four to five year experience. They wouldn't like to hear that. I don't, I'm like right now, this is like, I have to check myself and go, okay, what parts of my mind are going I'm, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of, you know, like, mm-hmm. cause it's just really kind of diabolical the way people, uh, if, if you, if you judge your life before and after the pandemic, if you judge where you can be at right now compared to what it was before, that could be, that'd be kind of difficult. And yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, I hope this is the end, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm prepared until 2024 sure. or 25 to be, Wearing yeah. a mask and if you choose getting an injection every once in a while. To keep <laughs> yeah. from getting- no, I, I definitely agree with you because there are people that I have encountered that are still talking about, we can't wait to just be over to get life back to the way it used to be. That's not going to happen. Yeah. I don't believe. Yeah. We yeah. will may get to a new normal, but I don't think we'll ever go back to life pre pandemic. Mm hmm. And while I was hopeful it wouldn't last this long, I did know that the last pandemic in the 1920s lasted three years. So last year, I knew that, you know, okay, we had, when people were out acting as if we were back to normal and yeah. being, in my opinion, reckless in some of their behaviors. Mm, yeah. I was in the house and I'm comfortable with being in the house. <laughs> you, and, you, 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 you getting, getting into your, your INF, uh, your I, uh, <laughs> yeah. from, from E to I is easy for you, but many people were just kind of going stir crazy and I can understand it, but yeah, you're right. And, and I had a personal experience in my family uh, with the coronavirus and uh, yeah, it, 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 if, unless you actually see it in action with somebody really getting sick, you don't r- realize the consequences. And it's, it's such a hit or miss thing. That's the thing. Like you, you could get it and have a light cold or nothing. Or mm-hmm. you could get it and be absolutely healthy, vaccinated, and have to have uh, be on a ventilator. It's crazy. You know, it's, yeah. it's weird stuff. Yeah. I was going to ask you, you said take it down the road. I think it's a great idea. But uh, I know I interviewed a guy named Yolo Achille Robinson who runs Beam, which is Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, uh, and does kind of what you were doing. You might want to check him out. I'll put a plug okay. in there for him. I interviewed him a couple of years ago. Doing the same kind of thing in the African American yeah. community, obviously. But uh, it might be somebody you could team up with or, or uh, just he might be able to promote. You could cross-promote each other and help each other okay. out. Yeah. I will certainly look him up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so... As we were talking about this thing, you know, we're hope you, you were talking about it in the past tense, post coronavirus, uh, post pandemic. Let's let's go down that. Let's let's be hopeful and say, what can we do post, and what can we do t- currently to to make things as good as as good as it gets for now? Yes, because really, it's it's uh, prospering through and post the things that we need to do now. Give needed attention to our mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. Um, Ensure that we are connected with others who care and support us. Um, And that may, for some people, that may be beyond their biological families. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of the things that the pandemic realized that, you know, there's so many different circumstances that people experience in their daily lives. And I think, you know, there are many that weren't aware of that and mm-hmm. took a lot of things for granted. Um, so for, for some people, you know, particularly, our, you know, our bound, more boundary level employees, frontline workers, who were pre-pandemic struggling, this has had a greater impact on them in terms of family dynamics, child care, and all of those kinds of things. Um, businesses, um, small businesses, and, and not just small businesses, but including small businesses. There are so many businesses that have closed and will never open. So now, you know, the yeah. impact on those individuals so I think there needs to be, ideally, if I if I were in control of this, we would be providing mental health services for children. You know, we had kids operating in a virtual environment for over a year. And then all of a sudden we thrust them back into a school environment without anyone talking to them and, and assessing what impact did that virtual ex- environment yeah. have on them? Yeah. And it, it wasn't the same for all kids because some kids didn't have the resources they needed at home or the parental support. Mm-hmm. And just as adults are still anxious about the uncertainty, imagine the impact it's having on children. Oh, yeah, because they're sponges. They're emotional and, and, and mental sponges. Absolutely. And yeah. I don't know if you're aware, they've been a, there's been a spike in disruption and violence in schools nationwide since schools reopened. I could see that. It's probably an acting out of whatever they have yes. gone through the past year and are continuing to go through at home. Yeah, absolutely. And no one's addressing that. So we have to address the children. We have to address the adults. Um, and with the support, and it's both mental health. One, it's a, an awareness piece that has to ha- happen. Right. To incur and provide the safety surrounding that so that people will be empowered to get the help that they need. Right, right, right. Because there's so much need that currently exists. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it is uh, we're having a tsunami of of sickness, you know, illness and and death, secondary or primary to the pandemic, but the next pandemic is just it's going to be this tidal wave of people processing things. You know, I was told that uh, from someone who's fairly knowledgeable in this that the nineteen eighteen nineteen seventeen pandemic, people didn't talk about it. It almost was written out of the history books. Mm. It's like, oh, that's done. Moving right <laughs> along, you know. So oh, like, wow! But, but we're kind of doing it in a in, different way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's being recorded. I mean, I think to a certain degree, it's not being broadcast, right? It's not like most television shows are ignoring it now. Like, like mm-hmm. there's some, you know, nod uh, given to the fact that it happened in some shows, you know, but. Uh, for the most part, it's like, you know, people are, people don't want to see actors with masks. Pretty people with masks on <laughs> aren't so pretty to them, right? So it's like they don't want to see that. And plus, it's kind of like turning a blind eye. But there's so much there's so much video footage. There's so much, you know, personal camera footage. There's just so much like – there's just so much there now. I don't think people will turn away from it. We're living it. Like we're living through it in real time, on social media, on Zoom, uh, we'll have to process it. I don't think we're going to just go into denial forthright and skirt around that and never talk about it again. I think it's going to be something that will be talked about for a while. Hopefully in a way that, that helps, like what you're doing with your initiative, in a way that helps to process it emotionally and learn from it. You know, I, I, I think that the pandemic has... It's, it's looked at the cracks and the fissures and the problems in society and magnified them because we have more time to do that, which is great, whether it's social justice issues or 
work issues, you know, the need. I think a lot of people's problems stem from not being able to put food on the table. I think a lot of the what we're experiencing is like socially is due to economic uh, disparities between the haves and the have-nots, right? You know, so and it's been more magnified. Yeah, yeah, and, and amplified during this time. And and people are are sticking up for their right to proper wages. People, I mean, more like the. Uh, some of the staff workers at, at uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the actual Art Institute just unionized. You know, they, they're unionized now, so they can kind of people are protecting themselves that way. So, whether you're pro con union or not, it means that you know probably wages will have to go up. It's going to be you know mm -hmm. and, and to stabilize things. Otherwise, you're just going to have more unrest. Yes, I would agree. Um... And especially in light of because of the supply chain issues, ah, yeah, everything has increased in price. <laughs> well, we we don't build things here anymore, right? You can't just uh, tell you know an Asian country that produces most of your things, <laughs> we're going to put a tariff on you. Go to hell! It. I mean, that's not that's not the main reason why things are happening. It's because of the pandemic, but. Everything is so interconnected now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but also it means there's a good reason. There's a good there's a good reason, if any, why we should have more woodworkers, more carpenters, more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, properly trained uh, trade laborers here, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, we got away from that. Um, yeah, and we did. Well, not everybody's going to go to like not everybody should go to college if they don't want to go to college to get a degree that's not going to that's going to make them 20 bucks an hour. Right. Right. Exactly. It doesn't, you know, it, yeah. you have to have trade labor and and vocad. That's not a bad thing. No, it's not. And that, you know, leads to folks living very, you know, comfortable lives. Uh, but for many years, we shied away from that. And steered those many in many cases, those who we knew weren't cut out for college. We steered them in that direction and I, sold them on this know, dream. Yeah. But, you know, that dream's not going to help if, if you, your plumbing goes out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want the plumber here now. Right. <laughs> and you and I both know right. how to yeah. pay plumbers when they show up. <laughs> yeah. I want a smart plumber who's going to be no nonsense and yeah right you know like mm -hmm. get the job done right you need those things and then the concern of you know we we need good health care providers mm -hmm. but what has this the worst and what has happened during the pandemic my concern is it's going to deter some great candidates from going in the health into the health care field yeah, I think it will. Um, there was re recently an ex uh, like an expose in the New York Times where they basically came out and said it, it's you know there's plenty of nurses out there right now. They're they're all walking out because they're getting burnt out because the hospitals refuse to hire the requisite number of them to do the heavy lifting of the medical field. It's penny pinching. I was surprised. I was surprised the Times actually said that, but wow, they actually said that. There's actually, if you if you subscribe or can get access to it, there's a video expose, a video story in the Times on that. Um, oh, definitely. And then they just they look in the you know a lot of nurses just shooting from the hip of what's been going on. Well, uh, so you're going to be taking this on the road, and uh, is there anything else? the follow-up that you, you kind of have in mind from, from your end as a consultant and a helper? What I am planning to do mm -hmm. is to develop a curriculum around this mm -hmm. to offer to employers. Excellent. Yeah. Because folks are still scrambling. Mm hmm in terms of, you know, many are trying to move into a hybrid environment. Employees are not comfortable coming back. There's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And the, based on those that I've talked to, they're really not understanding all the dynamics that are impacting people mm -hmm. 
who may be coming back. And if there isn't an attention given to that, yeah, we're going to have even greater challenges in our workplaces. Yeah, I, I saw an article. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the name of the person who was interviewed. You probably you might have seen this as well. It's this person who's been studying remote work for years. I think it was either in Barron's or I think it was in Barron's. Right? What on earth is a psychologist re- doing reading Barron's? <laughs> I read everything. Business. I read everything, right? So I mean, I think about the impact of these things systemically and, and otherwise. Um, he said that what he's he's definitely sees this trend. Forty percent of people are going to go to a hybrid Friday and Monday off, three days at the office, and some very some permutation of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, another fifty percent are going to they're going to have to do like medical work, in-person work, uh, retail work, uh, restaurant works, whatever mm-hmm. it is, they have to be on the job. They have mm-hmm. to push a broom, right? You know, God, God love them. Uh, they, have, they have to go fix the plumbing. 50% of people will have to be in the field, you know, police officers, whatever. And then the other 10% will just be entirely remote. That's what, they, that's what he sees as the trend happening. Okay. I mean, that's what he said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, that means that's going to change real estate in cities mm-hmm. and in towns. It's going to change a lot of things. Work, you know, work really affects everything across the board. Yeah, it's going to affect. So when most organizations have been operating with, in team environments for right. quite some time. Mm-hmm. So now team environment has been disrupted because it's very different in a virtual space. And when we talk about getting people back, If you have a three-day week, they're going to probably rotate people, so everybody's not going to be there because of space. Right. So that there's going to have – organizations will need to give more attention to ensuring that the team dynamics, team communication, all of those things are going to need added attention. And I don't think people are prepared for that. No. No. Uh, how could they be? They were already just trying to absorb what just hit them. And in addition, as you indicated, you know, that, you know, I have several clients that are already talking about reducing their footprint because mm-hmm. they don't need the square footage any longer. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and we'll be tied those who a year or two before the pandemic purchased or Mm-hmm. building and rented that out to other, you know, thinking they just pay off their mortgage uh, from, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And there's going to have to be organizations that do not have uh, employee wellness programs. That's going to be a, a essential. Yeah. I see that mental health will definitely be whatever uh, their, their, what they used to call fringe benefits of, of, of uh, insur- insurance <laughs> insurance uh, is it's going to have that component of mental health there. And a lot of places like many states are doing um, uh, parity for telehealth and uh, in, in person. Because before, like if, if we were doing this as a therapy session three years ago, mm-hmm. Corinthia, uh, I'd be lucky if I got half of what I'd get if you were sitting in this space. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But that's now, that's like parody, mm-hmm. which I'm sure the insurance companies, there'll be some pushback there, you know, like, but ha- so far in Illinois, so good. Right. Uh, right. But so, but there's going to be more of that, I think, telehealth for sure, you know, telemental health and, t- and just telemedicine. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It is. And, you know, just as I mentioned the need to help children in the transition back into schools, right. there needs to be some mental health support in them for employees going back to the workplace. I absolutely agree. I think that people don't know what's going on, what's hitting them. They're just kind of, we're kind of stumbling in the dark about this. I think 
all, <laughs> all everything that's come out of both White Houses during this has been some of it's been weirder at times than others. But uh, it's it's kind of like shot in the dark. See what works, you know. Take the best. We're all stumbling through this together. Yeah, we are, and th- there remains more questions than answers. And yeah. Yeah. you know, I would appreciate people just saying we don't know yet <laughs> versus. It's hard to do that. If you're paid to be a, a talking head for the government <laughs> to put people at ease, that is your job. I mean, how do you, you know, the building is on fire. It's okay. <laughs> but the fire, fire department is on the way. And it's the fire's not that hot <laughs> yet. No, I, I mean, yeah, it is kind of like that. It is ridiculous. But yeah, um, it is kind of like that. Um well, okay. We've been. I think we can probably uh, we could go on forever, but you probably have to to get moving and, and do things outside to talk to me on this Zoom thing. Uh, do you have anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, <clears throat> I just think I would hope that each individual who's hearing this will have a heightened sense of awareness of signs and symptoms that they may be experiencing as it relates to anxiety, depression. Um, And it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. Absolutely. And it's okay to seek help when you need it. Um, And in addition to that, pay keen attention to those that you love Uh, Because, you know, as you know, there's so many people who are taking their lives and people are saying, you know, oh, I didn't know. And I just think we need to do a better job of taking care of one another because we're still in this pandemic. And caring for ourselves, doing a better job of caring for ourselves, seeking the help that we need when and if we need it, and supporting others that we care about in their journey to health and wellness. And that includes mental health as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. I couldn't have put it better myself. Well, uh, Corinthia, uh, thank you so much for being here on the show. Uh, If people want to look you up, uh, I will, of course, have a link in the show notes, but can you, sometimes people will remember something because they hear it better, as you know. So okay. maybe you can tell them how people can look you up. Okay, thank you. Um, the name is Corinthia Barber, and I can be found my, at my website, www.kbmotivator.com. And I'm on all social media as KB Motivator. Awesome. Okay, well, everybody, take check her out. Thank you so much for being on the Psychology Talk Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Psychology Talk Podcast. This podcast is intended for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. All material, copyright, the Psychology Talk podcast. Music is provided by the oddly Italianate named band Serenati. Ciao.